First, just um, taking a step back and, and um, building on Tanya's last point about why, why is the post-2015 framework even important or interesting for us to, to focus quite a bit of, of energy on. Um, so I'm here representing Girls Not Brides, which is a, a network, uh, a partnership of about 300 organizations now working in 50 countries on addressing child marriage. Um, our members go from big organizations such as PLAN uh, to tiny community-based groups that are working on changing social norms within their own communities. And one thing that's come out as being important for the partnership is actually trying to make sure that the post-2015 framework um, does explicitly address the needs and rights of adolescent girls and um, of girls broadly and, and women. Um, and what we've had to do is actually think quite a bit about, well, how does that impact what's going on at a community level? So that's a little bit the framework that we've been using to think about why it is that we're, that we're interested in the post-2015 in the first place. And I think what we've come to realize is that it matters for a number of reasons. The post-2015 uh, development framework matters because, as has been said before, um, we can see that when the global community come, uh, rallies around global goals, change does happen. Um, it happens because policies are put in place. It happens because resources are brought to bear, financial resources. Um, but it also happens because there's a certain level of accountability. You have government leaders who have to stand up uh, every year and report on how they're doing. Now, imagine if we have a, a standalone goal on the rights of girls and uh, rights and needs of girls and women. This means that government leaders from across the world will have to stand up and tell their peers how they've been addressing the needs of, of half of their, their population. That, there's something huge, um, hugely important in actually putting that in place. We've been talking a lot about social norms. Well, I think having a, a, a standalone goal on, uh, on gender equality also creates this idea that there's a global social norm that boys and girls are equal, men and women are, are equal. And again, that puts pressure on the global community writ large that these are issues that are important, that they're not just issues that are kind of sideline nice to, to have. What we've also seen conversely with the MDGs is that if you don't specifically identify groups and issues that you want to focus on, um, they, they drop off. They drop off the radar. And we've seen that with, uh, with adolescent girls. Um, you know, because there wasn't an explicit focus, because there weren't explicit uh, indicators linked to what was happening to girls, people, and it's it's rational. People um, put their their scarce resources into all the other things that they knew they had to to report on. Um, so those are some of the reasons why uh, we've come to to believe that actually this is incredibly important. Um, so we were we we're really happy to see that both the high level panel. Uh, reports um, on the post-2015 development agenda and the UN Secretary, Secretary General's report highlighted the need, um, the needs and rights of women and girls and really made the case that these should be addressed in, uh, in these post-2015 development framework. But one thing that we do recognize is that, it's, I mean, it's, it's wonderful that there is finally this high-level Recognition. It's something that that's that's changed significantly since um, it, over the, over the last years and decades. But one thing we do realize is that because of the way these goals are structured and and framed, the d discussions and negotiations around these goals are not just going to be done by people who care about gender equality. They're not just going to be done by people who care about even development. They're going to be done by people who are looking at the whole a whole gamut from peace and security, environment, sustainability. And what we do know is that um, issues related to gender equality are often considered as 
less important. They're often considered fluffy. Um, you know, they're, 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 not, they're not considered the hard, the hard issues. And for most, you know, realistically, most of the people who are going to be doing the negotiating, this is not their top priority. This is often something that they would be willing to trade off, use as a, as a bargaining chip to, to achieve what they think is more important. So on that point, I'd like to, to again pull up something that, that Tanya was talking about, this idea of the smart development and, and how we frame some of, some of these issues around the rights and, and, um, uh, and, and the, the kind of economic arguments. I would say it's not so much um, just focusing on, um, on the economics, but also so making the case that the rights are fundamentally important in and of themselves, but also all these other factors that you want to achieve, well, you're not actually going to achieve them if you don't focus on on the, the rights and needs of, of women and girls. So it's not necessarily trying to say that um, you have to do it because it will increase your GDP, but if you're interested in increasing your GDP, well, you're not going to get there unless you, you bring women and girls into the picture in a, in a wholly inclusive way and don't leave them behind. So I think it's, it's really trying to, to sharpen our own arguments and our perspectives um, and really make the case to all those, all those groups. And I'm sure you know, many of, of you in the room are working on a whole range of development issues. And y you may think of uh, issues related to gender equality as being sort of tangential to what you're doing. I mean, obviously you're in this room, so you don't. It's not like super tangential, <laughs> um, but um, but that they're they're sort of a small part of what you're doing. But if you also start including some of that, um, the some of the importance of addressing gender equality within the you know how to achieve some of the overall goals that that you're trying to push for whether those are related to land rights I mean Grace gave some amazing examples uh, linked to, to land rights whether you're interested in education whether you're related to to health I mean thinking about the statistics that that Tanya brought up about um, about death um, in adolescence and and really trying to to pull that gender equality piece into those conversations that's what's I think ultimately going to, to help make the case that actually having the standalone goal is not just this kind of <laughs> fluffy nice to have to, to make the, the gender groups happy, but it's something that's going to be fundamental to actually pull the ho push the whole field forward. Um, I'm also just going to take uh, one, two more minutes, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, just to, to also touch on one point, which is, you know, we, when we talk about uh, goals, um, you know, if you take the example of the Secretary General's report, he talks about the importance of empowerment and well-being and social protection um, for some of the world's most vulnerable people. And I think what's, again, tactically quite important for us is to really think about how to translate that into specific concrete indicators that, that can help us figure out if we're making progress on this. Um, this is something that's fundamental because I think we often do get get caught up in some of the big picture and then some of the very specifics and we're not very good at tying those two together. So, you know, if so we've been making the case that that looking at child marriage as an indicator of one among many uh, as, a, as a way to measure progress against um, how to show how we're doing on a goal related to gender equality is one way to do that because it's it's well defined it's a, it's something that's being measured currently I mean there's there are data issues but the, you know you can fix those um, and it's something that's comparable and it's linked to some of these intractable social norm questions it's also related to progress on education, on health, um, on economic empowerment, etc., and and so really, as a as a community, thinking about what are some of those ways that that we can actually measure how we're doing as we're trying to achieve these big, bigger, loftier goals um, that may, in some cases, involve 
years, decades of change, particularly when there are situations where those traditional norms are so sticky. Um, so I'll I'll stop there with uh, with my reflections um, at this point, but happy to to continue as as we go along. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lashmi, and thank you for all three of our presenters this morning.